Welcome to the show. And in case you missed last week's episode, this week or over the next few weeks, I should say, we are doing something a little bit different. I'm giving away the audio version of my book, Relationship Sales at Scale, to you for free because you are a loyal listener slash viewer slash subscriber. Uh, if you missed last week's episode, I basically read or gave away the entire intro To the book. The name of the intro is Too Much Noise, and it's all about why you should rethink just about everything when it comes to B2B sales and B2B prospecting based on all the noise that's out there in the market, all the competition, especially when it comes to digital services. This week's episode, I'm going to read part two titled How to Balance Personalization and Scale so that you can keep your pipeline full regardless of your situation by doing outreach that's actually tasteful and actually effective. This is important, again, because people tend to get this wrong in one of two ways. Either they over-automate everything and create a spam machine and alienate their audience and achieve nothing, or they try to go one-to-one -one and never achieve any sort of scale and then ultimately burn out and then just they're left relying on referrals or inbound marketing alone, which is a non-starter. So from this particular chapter, you are going to get our methodology from a high level, basically soup to nuts. And then later in the next sections, we're going to get more tactical and get into campaigns that you can actually build. So after this intro, I'm going to actually read and give you part two. If you'd prefer to get access to the whole book right now in whatever format you prefer, you can scroll below uh, to click through to Amazon to get it there. And remember to stay tuned next week for part three. Thanks so much for tuning in. Welcome to the Digital Agency Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Englander. Part two, how to keep your pipeline full by balancing personalization and scale. Most salespeople go in cold because they feel it's their only option. I get it. Up until relatively recently, outside of unpredictable referrals, this assumption was true. Most salespeople are trying to leap a giant gap. Gene Schwartz taught us that the scarce commodity is no longer information, it's trust. Don't worry, the rest of this book won't tell you how to fake it till you make it or otherwise spoof trust. Instead, you will learn how to make your thousands of loose connections into strong ones and your hundreds of strong connections into qualified prospects refers, and long-term clients. While building trust can be challenging, the good news is that going in cold is no longer necessary. Your outreach does not have to summit a mountain, but rather walk over a small hill, since the goal is not to build the trust needed to close a deal, but just enough to de-risk a conversation and create a relationship. You might be familiar with the research of University of Oxford anthropologist and psychologist Robin Dunbar, who's famous for his Dunbar's number. According to a New Yorker article by Maria Konnikova in the 1980s, Dunbar was introduced to the social brain hypothesis, which postulated that primates have large brains because they live in socially complex societies. Stemming from that, the hypothesis argued that the bigger the primate's neocortex, the bigger the size of the community the animal inhabits. Dunbar brought the social brain hypothesis to humans. After comparing brain sizes and mean group volume, he found the same dynamic at play, and his research led him to a number. The average person could maintain 150 people in her social group. While the 150 figure is relatively famous, it's less known that Dunbar's research encompasses a series of groups that the average person can maintain. Through interviews combined with analysis of experimental and survey data, Dunbar found that, quote, the number grows and decreases according to a precise formula, roughly a rule of three, unquote. Here are the circles of influence we tend to keep. Number one, the circle of five, your closest support group, typically family or very close friends. Number two, the circle of 15, those you can confide in for most things and turn to for sympathy. Number three, 150 casual friends, those you might invite to a large party, i.e. Dunbar's number. Number four, 500 acquaintances, those likely to recognize your name and pick up when you call. Number five, 1,500 familiars, those whose face you can put to a name. 
While the effect of social media and mass digital communication on an entire generation is yet to be known, the current research seems to indicate that close relationships are not growing in response to the rise of social networks. After all, it takes a lot of time and resources to actually maintain friendships, and it's this cost that makes these relationships so meaningful. But here's what few appreciate. Your circles of influence can expand and change, and you can guide how this happens. With that in mind, I'm going to be so bold as to suggest a sixth circle. Number six, 5,000 lukewarms. Those who don't know you, but will be likely to have a conversation with you based on personal and or business commonalities. Don't worry, I'm not suggesting that you work your friends and family to uncover business opportunities. But what if you had the power to deliberately expand and optimize your loose connections, think groups four through six, in a way that reliably grows your business? At the very least, why not start with the prospects closest to you before expanding out to colder regions of the galaxy? This requires fundamentally rethinking sales. Instead of looking toward distant prospects as your best source for growth, you prioritize those who intersect with your circles of influence. To be more specific, you focus on your lukewarms. Those who don't know you, but will be likely to build a relationship with you based on an existing mutual relationship or strong commonality. Just like the real estate posse from my fluorescent grind, this is your tribe. But unlike the real estate posse, it's a much bigger circle and it's location independent. Your relationship map might look something like this, and to see the graphic that referenced the circles of influence, you can do that by going to saleschema.com slash audible, again, saleschema.com slash audible. Or to simplify things, be in the Venn diagram between your market and those who share commonalities. There is another handy graphic, but it's kind of self-explanatory if you can imagine a Venn diagram. Now that you have this framework, how do you implement it? The rest of part two will give you a tangible mental model for balancing personalization and scale. First, it's important to define personalization since it's a buzzword that's been thrown around so much as to become meaningless. According to Merriam-Webster, personalize to make personal or individual. With that in mind, personalization can mean a lot of things, so it's easier to pinpoint what it's not. For our purposes, tactics that fail to make the recipient feel as if they and they alone are being addressed do not meet the definition, which brings us to our next lesson, automation gang. When it comes to outbound sales, there tend to be two very loud opposing schools of thought, and both are wrong. The first is automation gang, and they tend to dominate the B2B sales space. Automation Gang uses spray and pray all the time, and they have the phrase numbers game tattooed on their foreheads. During any given week, the gang contacts thousands upon thousands of prospects. Their messaging emphasizes direct hard sell offers. If someone does not respond, they get a follow-up nudge and another and another in a matter of days. The Automation Gang must constantly set up new email sending domains since the major providers are onto them and route them directly to the spam box. Most prospects get annoyed and common responses include, go away, unsubscribe, no, various expletives. But if Automation Gang has to break a few eggs to fry up a delicious omelet, so be it. When faced with the concept of brand impact, Automation Gang laughs. Faced with few meetings and a dwindling pipeline, Automation Gang works harder. They try out new SaaS products, test copy and subject lines, and throw more case studies and collateral into the mix, but results don't improve. Here's how Automation Gang rolls. Below is a version of a recent failed drip sequence a marketing agency in our network had been running to brand side CMOs and VPs of marketing. The worst part was that they were putting painstaking manual work into list building, but they dropped the ball when it came to their outreach copy. Subject, your tweet this week. Hey Mary, I saw that you and your team recently posted on Twitter about the growth of influencer marketing, and it really resonated with me. I wanted to reach out to see if you would be open to a short introductory call to learn about our agency. Acme is a Miami-based creative agency, and our values are passion, creativity, curiosity, collaboration, and making a difference. We've been fortunate enough to partner with brands such as Big Brand 1, Big Brand 2, and even Big Brand 3. I'm sure you're busy, but can we find 15 minutes for a short call? Let me know, and I can throw out some times. Thanks, Chris. Two days later, hi, Mary. I wanted to check back on this and shed more light. Here's a case study on our work for Big Brand 3. Link. I'd love to explore how our creative capabilities might slot into Acme's marketing plans. Open to a call. Best regards, Chris. Three days later. 
Hi, Mary. Since I'm not breaking through here, I'll ease off for now. If you don't mind me asking, is there a time when it might make sense to reconnect about our services? Thank you, Chris. This is a buy or leave drip sequence. Copy like this fails because it makes big assumptions about needs, which inhibits the salesperson's ability to simply de-risk a conversation and build a relationship. In this situation, Mary is pushed into a corner, and she is left with two options. A, ignore the salesperson or tell them to buzz off or click the spam button. This is what happens 99% of the time. B, step into a sales process. Almost no one will go with B unless they are actively searching for the given solution being offered, which is rare and thus unsustainable. Worse, even if Mary is actively searching, she is unlikely to take a call with Chris since she shares no connection with him. And the weak level of personalization, i.e. the mention of a public tweet, is not enough to flip the script. Love Letter Gang On the other side of the island lives Love Letter Gang. It took a long time for Love Letter Gang to build up the courage to reach out to prospects since they were worried about coming off as too salesy and offending people. Love Letter Gang is hyper-obsessed with personalization, and they never let a single message go out before painstakingly researching each and every prospect and writing a completely customized message to each. Despite all the research and customization, it's crickets most of the time. Just like Automation Gang, Love Letter Gang sees very few responses, and some of them are tempted to ditch the whole process, claiming, Outbound just doesn't work for our special product or service. Here is how Love Letter Gang rolls. The following is an anonymized example of the sort of outreach a client of ours in the healthcare marketing space had been using before partnering with us. Subject, Therese meets Marco. Hey, Therese, hope all is well in Santa Fe. I'm writing because I saw we know a lot of the same people, including Ryan Thomas and Mary Smith, and we recently wrapped up a project with Acme, another healthcare organization in your neck of the woods. Also, I saw your post about the power of family referrals and provider selection decisions, and I couldn't agree more. We focus on influencer marketing for the healthcare space. We've been in business since 2006, and we've worked with clients in your space, such as Company A and Company B. I was curious about your Q4 and beyond marketing plans and wanted to see if you'd be open to a short call. Let me know if that sounds good, and I can send a few options. Thanks, Marco. The email is great overall. The problem was that the process for researching and sending fully customized, handwritten emails was tedious and impossible for their core team. As a result, our love letter gang worked in spurts, and their main salesperson only prospected during rare downtime. Since their process was so labor-intensive, it became fragile and it broke easily. Their activity ground to a halt when the company got busy with work or when the salesperson took time off. With enough time and energy, almost anyone can nail the personalization, but it means nothing without the consistency that comes from scale. Goldilocks Gang Just as with Porridge, Goldilocks is the right approach, and it's all about landing the right balance between personalization and scale. Too much scale and no one cares enough to respond, too much personalization, and the numbers game dynamics fail to kick in and the process fizzles out. It's tempting to overcomplicate things, but all outreach campaigns are built on just two components. Number one, the list. Number two, the copy. Both are important and have reflexive effects on the other, like paired ice skaters moving together across the rink. While the list and copy are the two levers you have to pull, these constraints can inspire more creativity and action than is found in other sales and marketing channels, which often require juggling many variables at once. Finding balance between personalization and scale means thinking differently about the whole process. In a traditional cold outreach process, you might buy or build a list of right-fit decision makers and then build a complicated funnel involving multiple channels and a lot of sales collateral and proof elements, followed by days and weeks of persistence and underinformed A-B tests. This all amounts to backloading the work. Let's say you buy a list or otherwise build or scrape one from easily accessible data like what you might find on LinkedIn. It's not uncommon that a big slice of the data is not current and that your prospect move positions, which creates bounces and deliverability issues that can stop a campaign in its tracks. It's relatively cheap and easy to buy or build a list of target prospects based on their titles and company types, like CMOs of growth stage e-commerce brands. There are countless list vendors and list building software widgets, and it's no surprise, information writ large is becoming more bountiful than ever, decreasing its value and usefulness. The B2B sales world is simply a small part of a much bigger picture. Remember, your prospects are sold to constantly on competing solutions and skepticism runs high, 
Like we covered earlier, you are selling to most aware buyers, and the scarce commodity is no longer information, it's trust. With the relationship sales at scale approach, instead of simply exporting a list of prospects and pitching them various ways like everyone else is doing, you will build distinct campaigns for generating consistent new relationships with those prospects who are already likely to connect with you based on business and or personal commonalities. You will harness the power of the loose connections who are sitting right in front of you, waiting to do business with you and generate consistent referrals. How Goldilocks Gang Rolls Remember the failed example from earlier where Chris and his automation gang forced his prospect Mary into a buy or leave situation? And at the same time, remember Marco and Love Letter Gang's unsustainable process? Now let's look at a better method that de-risks the conversation, uses a compelling commonality, and can be repeated at scale. Subject, intro Andy and Jerry, Germany connection. Hi Andy, I hope you're doing well. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Jerry. I was just reading about XYZ Co. and your profile came up. I noticed we have a connection to Germany. I went to Heidelberg University and lived in Germany for 15 plus years. I'm now based in San Francisco, but figured I would reach out to make a connection with you. I'm a co-founder of Acme Agency and am currently working full-time as a CEO. We specialize in digital marketing and have had quite a bit of success with our clients who include similar company A and similar company B. Anyway, I'm curious if you'd be open to networking informally. I'm always interested in connecting with new people and love that we had a common connection to Germany. Would you be open to connecting next week for a brief call? Thanks for your time, Andy. Kind regards, Jerry. A campaign like this one generated 73 prospects in less than three months for our client, and 53 of those went to the meeting stage. Prospects included senior marketing decision makers at L'Oreal, Mattel, Estee Lauder, Warby Parker, Catbird, Adidas, P&G, and Diageo. Here's how it was built. Front-loading the work over back-loading the work. Finding balance between personalization and scale means front-loading the work. While there is more work when it comes to list building and copywriting, there is less when it comes to everything else. You will spend more time pinpointing the exact companies you want to sell into, the commonality that binds you to the organization's stakeholders, and finally identifying prospects who share that commonality. The good news is that once you've done this upfront work, you won't have to fiddle with copy, drip sequences, and A-B tests so much. Distinct campaigns over automated machine. While batching, scale, and repeatable processes are important, the process revolves around crafting distinct campaigns instead of trying to build a fully automated, set-it-and-forget-it machine. While there is no one-size-fits-all process, building campaigns that ride the line between personalization and scale means contacting roughly 50 to 200 prospects per business day. Depending on your experience, this might seem like a ton of people or not that many, but it's a list you can reasonably manage. Unfortunately, the B2B sales world tends to sell services and products along the lines of constant automation, and it's important to break this spell. Since you are going for lucrative deals in a competitive, low-trust environment, isn't it natural that landing meetings with skeptical buyers should require creativity and glucose every so often? Planning campaigns and writing copy is important because what works today will not work tomorrow, and that's the rub. All that said, a single campaign like those I will cover next might keep you and your team busy with prospects and opportunities for many months. More importantly, instead of drudgery, the creativity of coming up with new campaigns can be fun and enlightening. You will build off of your previous wins and figure out exactly who is the right fit for your services, mapping your long-term vision to your day-to-day outreach process. This will be a valuable and enriching exercise. Thank you for listening to this section of my book, Relationship Sales at Scale. This and the next subsequent sections are going to be dripped out each week over the next however many weeks we have left, and they'll be available for a limited time. Or if you'd like to get access to the Audible version in its entirety or whatever format you prefer, you can do that by clicking below on the Amazon link. Thanks so much and stay tuned next week for the next section.